a broad space to cover today, so we're just going to jump right into this. We're going to go over kind of the key technologies and innovations that are impacting both patients and consumers from a healthcare perspective. Then we're going to jump into some of the challenges that are affecting the industry overall and kind of finish off with the future and the opportunities for you to get involved in this space and really kind of discuss and have um, a fireside chat around where the space is moving. So my name is Riley Ennis. I started Immuticon, a cancer immunology company where we focus on using the immune system to treat cancer, as well as Freenome, a cell-free DNA startup where we analyze sequences of DNA in blood to see how early we can detect cancer. And I have Sabah with me today, uh, who will introduce himself. Hello, everybody. I'm Sabah, and um, I'm a geneticist by training. And I started my career in drug discovery and development, but then got really interested in uh, proactive medicine of predicting disease before it becomes a big problem and treating it uh, very early on. And um, I have uh, switched careers and got into um, more predictive genetic testing, and um, I'm currently at Ariosa working on uh, one prenatal genetic testing, but also on uh, predicting cancer at early stages. And one thing we wanted to do was um, is to leave a few minutes at the end for anyone in the audience that might have a few questions for us. Uh, we would probably have enough time for maybe one or two questions at the end. Perfect. So if you could break down the landscape of what's going on in, I would say, consumer diagnostics, consumer yeah. genetics. I mean, what are the major technologies and startups that are impacting the space? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great place to start. And maybe I can give a very quick overview of what we mean when we talk about uh, proactive medicine. Um, since the, you know, the start of the modern medicine, what we have been doing is reactive medicine. We wait for someone to get sick, they get to the emergency room, they get to the hospital, they get to the doctor, and in most cases, the disease has advanced to a stage where it's really impacting the health, and it's um, um, harder to treat if it was diagnosed earlier. So this applies to cancer where, you know, if you can catch it before it metastasizes and spreads around the body, it's much easier to treat. This um, also applies to heart attacks and strokes. If you can predict them beforehand, before someone has a heart attack, it's much easier and much cheaper for the healthcare system to um, take care of as well. So um, in proactive medicine has become a very big thing in our field. Um, recently, I would say in the last decade, and in the last five years, this has accelerated with the um, accumulation of knowledge in diagnostics. And um, I see three major trends in, um, that's happening right now. In the, in the very short term, we have um, medical devices, diagnostic devices that consumers can use or are using right now, such as um, continuous um, um, blood glucose, blood sugar monitors that people are implanting that are moving into um, contact lenses, like what um, Google and a lot of other companies are working on, where you'll be able to pop in a um, contact lens and continuously monitor the blood glucose level of a person that might have diabetes, and hopefully um, be able to intervene before um, it gets to a point where that person needs to be hospitalized. Or something as simple as a wireless scale, where uh, patients with heart failure will wake up every morning, or are doing it right now, wake up every morning, get on the scale, and if they gain too much weight overnight because their body is retaining fluids, then it sends a signal to their doctor's office saying that this person is actually might be going into heart failure. And at that point, the treatment is very simple. It's a pill that costs $14, whereas if you waited a few more days, that patient needs to be hospitalized, and that's a hospitalization in the U.S. that costs upwards of $10,000. So something as simple as a blood glucose monitor that's implanted or a wireless scale that alerts the doctor of something that might be happening. These are all happening short term and are being piloted, are being used right now with the, with the patients. Mm -hmm. um, second trend that's actually um, 
blowing up right now is a field called uh, liquid biopsies. These are uh, screening tests that are being developed right now where from the blood of a patient, you are able to predict the, if there is presence of cancer in that patient at a very early stage. So um, something like colon cancer, which is very common, lung cancer, which is very common, or something like pancreatic cancer, which is really, really hard to treat, we'll be able to do a simple blood draw from patients maybe once or twice a year, screen their blood for the presence of DNA that's coming from specifically from cancer cells, and be able to, at stage zero or stage one, go in and treat that cancer in a much better way than we would have been if we caught it much later. And actually, Riley's company is working on um, a really cool liquid biopsy test currently. Yeah, and we've found that the biggest challenge when you're sequencing little strands of DNA in the blood, trying to find that one or two cancer-related DNA strand, there's a signal-to-noise problem. This is finding a needle in a haystack. And in order to do this, when you have millions and millions of DNA sequence reads, it becomes a great place for a software solution. So using a data analysis pipeline, you can really hone in on what are the cancer-related DNA sequences. And the beauty of detecting someone early is not only the opportunity to get them on treatment, but using the DNA to connect patient genetic information to the right treatment. And that's where the predictive medicine comes in. And this is not something where you're replacing an oncologist. You're really empowering them to say, given this genetic information for a patient, these are the couple of drugs that tend to respond better. And we're still in the early stages of targeted therapies, of connecting genes to treatment. But over time, every year, new genes are being discovered, and clinical studies are validating which genes tend to correlate with responders and non-responders. So at Freenome, we're really focused on trying to build out the software and empower the oncologists as well as pharmaceutical companies as they're developing these new drugs. And I think just across the board, not only in oncology, there's a lot going on in predictive medicine. I don't know if, Sabah, you want to talk to that Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And, you know, we can't stress this enough with this audience that um, it really is, we are gathering a lot of data in healthcare with these new technologies, and now it's turning from, you know, do we know what causes this? And it's moving away from that. It's moving into more of a data problem where we're gathering a lot of data and as Riley mentioned, finding that signal there and actually providing actionable data to the doctor and the patient is becoming the bottleneck for us to be able to um, get better in this field. And I think this audience has a lot to add to it with, with the uh, cumulative knowledge that has been gathered in the tech field of looking at these very large data sets and being able to pull out the um, very you know, weak signal that we're seeing in there. Um, we ran an experiment recently, and when you look into the blood of a patient with cancer, right, you pull out 11 billion DNA molecules, and only 100 of those are originating from the cancer. So you know, really uh, working on making sure that we can put away that 10 billion, 900 million, 999 molecules away and really focus on those 100 that's actually giving us the information and data that we need to be able to treat that patient better moving forward. Yeah. And one thing I think you brought up kind of backstage that I thought was really interesting is an educational gap, yeah. uh, not only just for the general pu public and the consumer genomics where 23andMe is trying to pioneer an understanding of your own genome, but even with clinicians in yeah. terms of genetics. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, this is what I see every day when uh, we're working with um, doctors all around the world, primary care physicians, and um, you know, talking to them about these new pioneering new genetic tests that are coming out. Most of the doctors, you know, rightfully, they you know, last time they took a genetics class was in, you know, 1986 when I was four years old, right? And so they, you know, 
go back and look at the data that we're providing to them. And most of the doctors are like, well, this is really complicated. This is really complex. And I don't really understand it myself, let alone explaining it to my patient. And I think that this really creates a block in uh, making these new you know, proactive and predictive diagnostics more broadly applicable to the patients because patients don't understand them as well. You know, because of that, I think they think that it's scary and the doctors don't understand them that well and they think that it's scary. And I think we in the field can do a better job of communicating it, but we could also use a lot of help that has been um, gathered in other fields on um, distilling complex information and making that available in an actionable package to both doctors and the patients so that it goes away from you know, the scary, very sciencey medical stuff into something that they can di digest and make better, more informed decisions on. Because I think you know, the easier we make it for doctors and patients, the more prevalent these tests will become, the more prevalent they become the better we'll be able to treat the patients and also we'll be able to better um, impact the healthcare. We'll you know, remove the issues before they become and then also be able to um, make healthcare more affordable because as you guys all know, um, the healthcare costs everywhere in the world, especially in the US, but everywhere in the world is just going out of control and we need to figure out a way to deliver better care for cheaper, faster for patients. Yeah. And kind of shifting gears to the FDA and regulatory bodies around the world, how are they viewing all this data and information, not only protecting patient identity, but protecting from a security perspective? I mean, let's focus maybe on the FDA, but how are they viewing all these different applications? Yeah, I mean, regulatory bodies are trying to understand what's happening. This is a field that's moving very, very fast. And I think um, in most cases, the regulatory bodies were not ready for, you know, the amount of data that we were, you know, we ended up generating and the impact that we ended up having in such a short time in um, healthcare how many tests that we developed um, in our lab in California became the fastest growing genetic test in history within two years of launch. And um, my, you know, our, our interactions have been limited, but my understanding is that regulatory people want to help and they want to make sure that um, these tests do what they say they do. At the same time, um, you know, there are resource constraints that they are saddled with. So I think it's, going to be a lot of collaboration between the industry and regulatory bodies on both ends to be able to come to uh, solutions because the older model of you know drug development where it takes you know 10 to 12 years for a drug to go through clinical trials before it gets to patients is not sustainable in diagnostics because we're coming out with a new test once every three months and making it available to the patients and um, um, the model, I think, has to change and become much faster to keep up with it. Great. So I think we have five minutes left, and I think we want to open it up to questions. We have a microphone here in the front. Uh, you can just, I think, walk up either in the back or in the front here. Great. If you guys want to walk to the yeah, microphone. Yeah, we have microphones in the front. Sorry. Yeah. The microphones are in the middle aisle, one up front and then one on the back. years ago in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And now I'm interested, when I go back every, twice a year for my checkups, so far so good, uh, but it's, it, it's really a physical test I get, I get. My own diagnosis was discovered by accident uh, through a scan, just a simple scan and they discover something growing there. So uh, is there, are the tests applicable after chemotherapy? Yeah, so I, I think I can yep. speak to this a little bit. There are clinical studies that are correlating the accuracy, which is both the sensitivity and specificity of just using your blood to detect the recurrence of disease. That means if you're a patient who has you know, successfully received chemo, gone into remission, we can actually use blood to monitor for that recurrence. And the beauty of this is 
it's a simple blood test. There's no, hopefully, no CT scan. And if the te test is sensitive and specific enough, you can catch the disease early before the recurrence relapses, as well as whether or not the treatment is even working. So if a patient's on a specific drug, you want to know very quickly whether or not that drug is adding any value or adding benefit. And if you're seeing that the tumor DNA content in the blood is increasing, getting larger, getting more mutated, then you know that the treatment isn't working for them. So I think there's a great opportunity kind of across the spectrum for patients, both for the screening test, but also for the monitoring through time, where you can really get resolution from taking multiple time points, which I think is a really exciting area from a data analysis perspective. Um, and maybe two years ago, that might have sounded like science fiction, but I would expect that within the next year, there's going to be a lot of tests that patients can take that does exactly what Riley mentioned, and then maybe become the standard of care in the modern world in the next five years, which is really, really exciting for us to see how fast it's moving into patients. Hi, guys. Next question. Um, I'm coming into health tech from purely um, product, ma product management perspective, so tech. I'm about to join a company who uh, is working on a, a diagnostic device to be used at home on a consumer level, so we're not talking doctor office, consumer level at home. I need to test. It's not FDA approved yet. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. So how did you resolve that with your companies and what would be your advice? I couldn't get the end of your question. Could you please ask again? In order to um, market the device, in order to make sure that it's safe, it's a great okay. customer experience, you need to test it. It's not FDA approved yet, but in order to be FDA approved, it needs to be safe. Yeah. Safe. It needs to be uh, tested and validated that it's yeah. safe for people. Yeah. So before you actually did that, that you had proof for FDA that it's safe, how do you, how do you test? So yeah. chicken and the egg. Yeah. How do you resolve that? Yeah. No, that's a great question. First, welcome to healthcare. We can use more people like yourself from different backgrounds. And um, I think that's a great question, and I'm a big proponent of um, making sure that before you put something out there that can really impact people's health or their perception of their health, that it should be properly validated and tested. And um, there are a lot of uh, programs out there that, you know, FDA route is one of the ways to go. In Europe, there is the CIBD uh, route that people can take, and there are a lot of um, um, avenues that one can take to do the right clinical validation, um, either before something gets to the market or while it's in the market to make sure that what you're promising that it does to the patients is actually what it does. And this is, you know, critical because, you know, in another field, you know, you get a software out there and it doesn't do, it's buggy, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you can always go back and fix it and hopefully not a huge issue is caused, whereas this is people's health and you want to be very, very careful about what you actually tell them and what you're delivering. Great. And I mean, I think a little bit, even with Harmony, there's CLIA lab certifications. There are certifications where, which are data-driven and it's a way to, I wouldn't say, I mean, have some regulatory process in place, but also increase the speed and time to market for some of these tests. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. So we only have a couple seconds left. Um, so maybe one very quick question. Just a quick question, I've touched on this already. Um, there's gonna be a huge amount of information generated with these tests. existing medical infrastructures? Do you see that there be a new specialties developing? How, how do you see this information being communicated? Um, I know you've only got a little bit of time, so a short answer. Yeah, I, th I think an interesting trend with genomic data, at least, uh, which is a very complicated data set, is how the EHR, the electronic health record, and EMR, the medical record companies, are engaging with genomic information. So I think that as technology is kind of moved into some of these medical records, that the explanation and kind of the understanding of these complex data sets might move through those channels, uh, more from distribution and getting to 
many physicians. And I think on top of those infrastructures are the analysis pipelines, the platforms for explanation, and hopefully there'll be some level of standardization that kind of comes with that. But it's an interesting trend where these EHR companies are really engaging closely with the physicians um, and you know, in turn the patients. Yeah. And there are a few great talks about this uh, later this afternoon as well. So stick around for those. Thanks. Great, thank you guys so much. Thank you.